Hello, I'm making a game. So far, I have a player versus player sword fighting deathmatch, but plan on expanding it into a cooperative action RPG. Before moving on to any major changes, I had a bunch of bugs and minor tweaks that I wanted to make. I had an inconsistent animation bug, where attempting to play an animation such as rolling twice in a row would cause the animation to freeze on its final frame, due to the animation not resetting to the beginning before being played again. After many hours of banging my head against a wall, I managed to fix this by setting the process mode of my animation tree and player to manual and advancing the animation tree inside of my physics process. Queued rolls were fixed to the same direction as the initial roll, so I made sure to update the input vector when a roll is queued to allow for much more exciting gymnastic routines. While playing around, I realised that you can easily change the speed of your game in a line of code, so immediately added slow motion whenever someone dies. I've had a ton of useful feedback on my previous videos, which I'm very grateful for, and will be taken on board. Starting with Generic Name, who suggested I make the sword wiggle when held behind the player. I made some very simple wiggle animations, and got them added, which I think is a nice touch. Juni gave some very useful feedback on making the game feel more responsive. You previously had to precisely time your button presses with the end of each swing to perform a combo, which I removed, allowing you to button mash attack to combo to your heart's content, which definitely feels better. However, something about the heavy combo looked off to me. At first, I thought it was the backwards jump the body makes when pulling back for the next swing. But that also occurs in the light attack combo, which I think looks fine. Slowing it down, I realised it was the forwards motion of the lunge, clashing with the backwards motion of the body. I fixed this by greatly reducing the player's velocity when the combo animation starts. Quick note from future me, I'm not sure how I didn't spot this at the time, but while editing this video I noticed that the sword jumps forwards before pulling back, which adds to the weirdness. I'll get that fixed further down the line. Next up, it was time to give my UI a facelift. To make health and stamina bars, I played around with the theme on some progress bar nodes until I thought they fit with the style of my game. I connected their values to the player's stats and flipped them for player two. I also thought it would be a good idea to display the player's head sprite next to their respective health bars to reduce confusion on whose is whose. Hirota very sensibly suggested that I don't keep my blood particles indefinitely on screen, which could be very performance heavy. So I animated the particles to fade out and delete themselves. And finally, I made a new kill counter in a handwritten font, which I feel matches the vibe of the game. As I was working on UI, I thought I'd add a very simple menu with fade transitions to allow people to quit the game without pressing Alt F4. The next thing I was most excited to work on was controller support. I added buttons for attack and roll, which was very easy to set up. Adding a joystick for movement was ever so slightly more complicated, as by default a joystick allows movement in any direction, and I wanted it restricted to eight directions to keep the experience consistent between controller and keyboard. So I added a little bit of code to round the input angle to the nearest 45 degrees. I spent some time working on my menu, changing the font to Vividly by Tata, which I find much more readable, and adding a controls menu where a player can assign a specific controller to each player with the press of a button. In the back end, this works by getting the device ID and adding the appropriate buttons to the input map. I'm really pleased with a new UI and think it makes my game feel a lot more like an actual game. The next big change I wanted to work on, as suggested by Lettuce Game, was blocking and parrying. I made some super simple block animations, where the player holds their sword out in front of them. I added a new block state, which is entered when the player holds the roll button, which needs a little more work. I made it so you don't take damage while in the block state, however, this also isn't quite right, as hitting someone in the back should still damage them. So I introduced a simple direction check when a block occurs to check if a damage should be applied or ignored. I didn't want a player to be able to block indefinitely, so what made sense in my head 
was to subtract the poise damage that would have been taken on a successful attack from the defending player's stamina instead. If they don't have enough stamina to absorb the poise damage, the block is unsuccessful. They take damage and enter the staggered state. To better explain, I added a poise bar so you can see what's happening. A light attack takes off a little health and poise. When blocking, the damage is negated and the small amount of poise damage is taken off their stamina instead. A heavy attack takes off a bit more health and a huge amount of poise. So blocking a heavy attack is not such a great idea as your stamina will be heavily drained. To add parrying, I start a timer when a player starts blocking. And if an attack is blocked within a fraction of a second, the poise damage is actually deflected back on the attacker. I added some particles and knockback, which I think really helps make what is happening clearer. I've ended a bunch of playtesting with some friends, which was super fun, which I think is a really encouraging sign. I could keep working on combat forever, and there are a few things, such as different weapons and special contextual attacks, which I will be adding sooner rather than later, but I also want to actually make a cooperative game, so I thought it was time to leave the combat for now. I created a settings script and made a friendly fire variable. When set to true, the players can hurt each other. Setting it to false means they no longer can. I achieved this by setting the collision mask on the player's hurt boxes to only look for enemy hitboxes instead of both player and enemy hitboxes like normal. Next, I duplicated my deathmatch scene and added a new button for co-op, which launches the new scene. When the new scene is launched, friendly fire is turned off and the kill count is hidden as it is no longer required. I then remembered that some people may actually want to play the game on their own, so renamed the co-op button to Story, added a sub-menu for launching either a one or two player game, and got it set up so player two and their UI are deleted when a one player game is launched. I then worked on adding a camera to follow the players as they explore outside the small rectangle I previously had them restricted to. I will link the tutorial I used in the description, which worked great. However, my UI elements should remain fixed in the corners of the screen. Godot has a specific node perfect for the occasion. Adding a canvas layer as the parent of my UI elements does the trick. Now my only issue is this jump the camera does when starting a scene. This is because the camera smoothly follows the player using linear interpolation, or lerp as it is known to friends. This causes the jumping as the camera takes time to move from its default position to where it should start. I fixed this by adding a function to my camera, which does exactly what it normally does, but without the lerping, and calling this function when the scene is launched. And with those tweaks, I have a camera that I'm really happy with. Next up, it's time for some enemies. I created a new enemy scene, which inherits the functionality of my player scene which I will be using for humanoid enemies in my game. I modified the player script, essentially by commenting out all the code relating to player input, and dropped a load of enemies in my scene. Which surprisingly worked, we now have non-player characters who can take damage, be staggered and die, but they need to be a little smarter. So I added a player detection zone, which will cause the enemy to move in the direction of the player should they be so foolish as to enter it. This basically works by simulating a controller input in the direction of the player and using all the movement functionality and animations I already had set up for the player. Next, I added a much smaller attack zone, which works in much the same way but causes them to enter the attack state. It was at this point where I started to feel immensely guilty for massacring hordes of smiling frogs, so I started drawing my first enemy, the love child of Scarecrow and an Ewok. I call them Sackface. I took pictures of my drawings, increased the contrast and brightness to turn them into outlines, cleaned them up, coloured them in, and got them added to my game. And now I can playtest my game with a clear conscience. One issue I noticed is that in certain situations the enemy can change directions extremely rapidly, which looks a little strange. So I added a timer to limit direction changes, which is noticeable if I set it to a super long time like 2 seconds, but will actually be a fraction of a second. Another issue is that they will try to walk towards you when they're out of stamina, even if they're right next to you. So I made them enter the block state when below a certain threshold of stamina, and resume their normal shenanigans when back above a higher threshold. 
I then added comboing, and gave them a random chance of performing a combo to make them a little less predictable. And while I was at it, I gave them a chance to perform a heavy attack too. At this point, Sackface was capable of putting up a pretty good fight. I wanted to see what would happen if I simply scaled Sackface up. And it worked, which is great, because enemies of different sizes should be straightforward to implement. One thing I really wanted to do was be able to slow down walking and attack animations on enemies to make them easier. I worked out this was possible by replacing all of my animations with blend spaces, containing the animation passed through a timescale modifier. You can find the property path of a timescale in the inspector for the animation tree, and then modify these values in code, which works great. This allows me to really easily make enemies of varying difficulty. I laid out a different arrangement of environmental objects, and positioned a few enemies of increasing difficulty, ending with Big Sack Face. I noticed an issue where Big Sack Face wouldn't hurt you if you stood right under their feet. So tweaked my hurt boxes to correct for this, and now I have a playable test level that I'm very happy with. There are issues to be addressed, such as a super slide glitch, enemies not retargeting when they get hit, and a lack of pathfinding, but they're problems for future me. I will include a download to the game in its current state in the description. All the feedback and support so far is greatly appreciated, and thanks for joining me as I stumble my way through making a game.